God bless you, Brother Neville. So happy to be back in the church tonight. Just a teeny bit hoarse. Kind of a long message this morning. And I'm sure happy it was here, old, and enjoyed it myself. I bring it, and I hope you enjoy it here. <clears throat> Don't forget now, always remember this, that these are the things that build the servant of Christ. See? Faith first, then virtue. And now remember, the Holy Spirit cannot kept the building of God until these things are operating by the Amen. No matter what you do. See, those are the things that builds the body of Christ. Amen. See, those things. Now, don't forget that. That this year is, first is your faith, virtue, knowledge, and so forth is to be added to it until the complete statue of Christ is made manifest. Then the Holy Spirit comes up on it and seals it as one body. Amen. These things must be. Therefore, Jesus said, by their fruit they are known. See? Fruit. You could not bear fruit without these things to bear it in you. And then when all this takes the place of worldliness and, and ungodliness and so forth, then all unbelief is cast out. Then all the things of the world is passed away. Then there's nothing but a new creature in Christ. And then Ephesians 4.30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed to the day of your redemption. Sealed into the kingdom of God. Now don't forget that. Keep that in mind now. Takes these things first. Then the sealing is the Holy Spirit, the cap that seals us into the body. All right. We got a, a request now for a sister Little of Chicago. Her husband has been in an automobile accident and is laying just at the point of death. A sister Little. And Edith Wright, our little sister here, uh, that we've known for so long, she's very very bad at her home tonight. And they wanted to announce this to the church so we could all pray together for this request. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment. Our precious Heavenly Father, we are gathering around by faith the throne of God. And we are asking for divine mercy for these requests. Brother Little, a car accident near death. God help him. May the Holy Spirit be at his bedside and bring him back to us, Lord. And little Edith Wright down there. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will be by the side of her bed tonight and will restore her health to her again. Granted, Father, Thou hast promised these things. And we believe that. And as we were thinking this morning that distance means nothing to you. You are just as great one part of the world as you are the other because you're omnipresent, omnipotent, and infinite. And we pray, Father, that you will grant these requests through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Very happy to be in tonight again to and I know it's hot these are three straight meetings and it's I know some of you's got as much as 500 miles to drive between now and morning and starting after tomorrow I got 1400 to drive after that so uh, so I I trust that it's been a great time for all of you and uh, it's been a great time for me to visit with you there's only one thing that we have requested. So many has to be turned away because there's no room. We can't jam the aisles too much. The far uh, uh, apartment will not uh, stand still for that. So uh, we're trying now to get a little bigger a church so that when we're in, then we can have a seating room for the people. And now, anytime, you're always welcome 
here at the tabernacle where we have no creed but Christ, no law but love, no book but the Bible. And so, and our pastor is Brother Armin Neville here, and we have the congregation here, have, have many people who gather in as an interdenominational tabernacle, or you come here and worship God according to the dictates of your own conscience. We're always glad to have you. And um, so, come when you can. We're always glad to receive you. And now, the next time, as far as I know, to be with you will be after the church is completed. And I want to then, after the church ages, that we want to go then to the seven uh, last seals. And um, the seven last seals in the book of Revelations to teach that. And now there's so many times that sick and afflicted comes. And during these meetings where visions are required, and come for special interviews. If I get into that, then I'm, I just can't get the difference between them. And I, you know, it's hard for me to speak after that. And everyone knows that in our healing campaigns that Mr. Baxter or someone usually does the preaching. And I come out to pray for the sick because it's just a little strenuous. And I was praying for some people a few moments ago and then I met a little child here that the doctor's something in his back is born some way. Coming out, I seen it sitting there in a the cast. That child I never had to be crippled like that. It's going to be well. Sure. That's, I know that. I'm positive of that. So, we want to have our faith and believe in God. Each one of you, and many of you are strangers to me, all ministers and so forth. If I'm not mistaken, this is Brother Crace. Is that right? Brother Crace, I, I owe you an apology for not getting up there on that dedication. Maybe I'll get up there for a weekend meeting and be just as good. Is that right? Up at Bloomington. Are you doing well? Good. Some of these brothers here are ministers, I suppose. You're a minister? Yes, sir. Lord bless you. And how many ministers is in the building? Let's see your hand. Oh, that's just fine. We're glad to have you here. Just so happy. God ever bless you. Now, so that we can get out real early, some of them are going to Georgia, Tennessee, New York, everywhere from tonight, starting tonight. Now, drive careful along the road. If you get sleepy, you don't want to go to a motel, drive off the side of the road and sleep. Do you? That's the way I do. Okay? Just drive off and sleep. Don't, don't drive while you're sleeping. It's a bad thing. And uh, remember, it's not you. It's the next fellow you have to watch. Okay? You know where you're going. You don't know where he's going. <laughs> so, so you have to watch that guy. <laughs> so be sure that you be alert all the time to watch for it. Now, I wish to read tonight a portion of Scripture found over uh, in the book of St. John. Now, these little uh, Scriptures that we read and refer to are to give us a basic for what we are trying to say. And always, I have never one time as I ever remember of ever coming to the pulpit to try to just say something to be saying. I always try to, to wait, watch, study, pray until I feel that I have something that would help the people. If I can't be a help, there's no need to be standing here, see. Let's try to help. And now tonight... Uh, of course, the bigger part of our crowd has moved out from this morning, and uh, they had to go home, many of them. But uh, tonight, I told you, if you stayed over, we try to have just about a 45-minute talk on something that I hope would help us. And we're going to base this now on St. John, the 16th chapter. And let's begin about the, um, the seventh verse of the 16th chapter and read through the, the 15th verse. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world 
is judge. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. For he shall glorify me, or he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now, in this thirteenth verse, How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you unto all truth. Amen. When the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Amen. What is truth? The Word. For he shall speak, he shall not speak of himself, but what he hears, he'll speak. What he hears, he'll speak. In other words, he'll be the one that will reveal the thing. And the fourth chapter of Hebrews, the Bible said that the word of God is sharper, more powerful than a two-edged sword, a, a discerner of the thoughts of the mind, the heart. See, what he hears, he'll speak. And he will show you things to come. Amen. What's going to do that? The Holy Spirit Amen. who will come in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And I would like to take these next few minutes to call your attention upon the word guide. A guide. You know, I've had some quite experience in the woods. A guide. Someone to show you around. You have to have a guide when you don't know where you're going. And being acquainted with hunting and the world around, I've had the, the opportunity to meet guides, and I am a guide myself in Colorado. Because knowing the country, ranching, so forth, I can guide in Colorado. Now, a guide has to know the way. He has to know where he's going and what he's doing and how to take care of you along the road. He's got to see that you don't come up lost. A guide is a selected man. The state selects this man. If he is a guide. And now, in going on a trip into the wilderness where perhaps you're not used to going, it's not a good thing for you to go without one. Frankly, some places you can't even go without one. For instance, Canada. The, the guide has to sign your license to the game warden. He has to sign himself in and he is responsible for you. If anything happens to you, it's his responsibility. He's got to take care of you. He's got to see that you're not lost. He's got to be sure that he don't send you in somewhere that you don't owe your way back. And if you do get lost, he's got to know the country so well that he can pick you up just any time. He's got to know all these things or he cannot be a guide. He cannot be licensed to be a guide. For these things, sometimes you have to have an appointment, call ahead and make arrangements, get reservations to be taken out. And if you're, uh, sometimes he's filled up. And he cannot take you. You have to put it off for a while. Uh, of, of the earthly guide. You never have to do that with God's guide. He's always ready. Always ready. Now, if you don't get these preparations made, and you're figuring on taking a trip into the wilderness where you haven't been before, you may come up lost and perish. you got about 1% chance to get out of the wilderness. That is, if it isn't too dense, you might have 1% chance to get out by yourself. But if it's a very bad wilderness, way back, you haven't got a chance to get out. There's no way to do it because you find yourself on the death wall and then you, you're done, then you're finished. Now, and then you'll perish if you haven't got a guide that knows the country and knows how to get back. Many of you are acquainted with the article you have read last year 
out of Tucson, Arizona. Those boy scouts. Yet they were trained to know how to take care of themselves. They were scouts. And they were not just cub scouts. They were full scouts. And they took a trip up into the mountain. And a snowstorm come. Nature changed its position. And when they found themselves lost, and all of them perished, is because that they something changed comes along from the regular routine. They didn't know how to get out. See? And I forget how many boys there was that perished in the mountain. Though they had helicopters and the militia out and the National Guards and volunteer help and everything, but they were lost. No one knew where they were at. And they could not take care of themselves. They all perished in the snow because they didn't know where they was going east, north, west, or south, up or down, or how it was. Everything looked the same. Now, a guide knows where he's at, regardless of the weather. He's, uh, he's equipped to do that. He knows what he's doing. He's familiar with everything. He knows the looks of everything. So he can just be in the darkness. He can feel a certain thing. For instance, here's an old trick to a guide. You know, if you can see the stars, anyone can tell which way you're going. If you watch the stars, and you always want to watch the one true star. There's only one true star, and that's the North Star. See? Only one. He stands in the same place. That represents Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Others might wander away, but He remains the same. Churches may tr draw you off this way, or some draw you off that way, but not Him. He's always the same. Well, now, if you can't see this North Star, and it's cloudy... Then if you'll notice, if it's daytime and you're lost, if you'll watch the trees, the tree is always, the moss is on the north side of the tree because the south side of the tree gets the sun more than the north side. But what if it's dark and you can't see the moss? If you close your eyes and don't try to do any thinking, close your eyes and get a slick bark tree. Put your hands around the tree like this till your fingers meet. And then start moving around that tree real slow. And when you hit a place where the bark is real thick, broke up, that's the north side. <laughs> the wind. And you can tell which way you're heading, north or south. And that way, oh, there's many things. But it takes guides to know how to do those things. Just an ordinary man get up there and say, I don't feel no difference in this. <laughs> See? You've got to be trained for that guiding. And these boys, no doubt that they were fine scouts. They might be able to tie knots. They might be able to make fires with rocks and so forth like that. But to know your way out, that's the idea. They, they did not know their way out. So therefore, they all perished because they didn't take a guide with them. An unthoughtful father, two years ago in Colorado, always going up into the mountains, he had a little boy about six, seven years old. He's going to take him on his first deer hunt. So they went high up on the mountain, and the little boy said to his daddy, I'm getting tired. Get on my back. We're not high enough up yet. The deers are high. On, on, on went the man. Until he got, he didn't know he was a city man. He didn't know nothing about how to hunt or where to go. Any man that knows anything about wilderness knows the deer don't stay up high. They don't go up there. Goats stay up there, not deer. They're down where they can feed. They got to get where there's something to eat. And so, but this man thought if I get way up in the rock somewhere up there, I'll find a big buck. He's seen a picture or something standing up on, uh, standing up on a rock, and he thought that's where he'd find him. Don't pay no attention to what them magazines read. My, oh my, you'll have a nightmare. Uh, there's only one thing to do is take a guy, or you know where you're at. And that father had come up a rain all at once up there, well, then quick rains it comes, and the man hunted too late till it got dark, and he couldn't find his way back. And the, then the winds come across the top of the mountains and he himself moving fast and that you have to know how to survive if you're caught out. There's another thing, know how to survive. I've climbed up trees and slid down and climbed up trees and slide down, up and down like this to keep alive. 
of tuck snow away with me, four foot on each side, bust the stump and lay it down and so hungry that I couldn't hardly stand it and bust up these old stumps and light them and let it get hot and melt the snow down and then about one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, pull the stumps back and lay down on that warm ground to keep alive and you have to know how to do these things. And this man didn't know what he was doing. He had nobody with him to direct him. And he held his own little son against his bosom until he felt him cool off and die. Unthoughtful. If he just took a guide with him, he could have brought him right back down the mountain regardless of what time it was, see? But he waited till it gets dark. Then he couldn't see his way around. That's the trouble with Christians today. They wait till the darkness settles over. Then you find out that you've left without the guide. The guy. Why did you ever see a man that was lost? Did anybody ever have the experience of bringing in a man lost? It's the most pitiful thing you've ever seen. When a man gets lost, he goes wild. That's right. He don't know what he's doing. We caught a man out there, a boy, and he'd been lost in the woods, and he was thought he was a rancher, but he's in a wrong territory, and he got lost, turned around. And when they found him, three days later, he was running like a wild man, screaming to the top of his voice. His lips was all eat up. And he tore his gun away. And he didn't know what to do. And when his own brother, when they had to catch him in time, when his own brother come to him, he fought at him like an animal. Tried to bite him. He didn't know where he was at. Why? He was lost. When a man's lost, he's in a state of bewildered. And he don't know that he's in that state because his being lost sends his fever up on him then he doesn't know where he's at and how he's acting. So is it when a man's lost from God. He'll do things that he ordinary wouldn't do. He'll do things that it's beyond the thoughts of a human being doing. A lost man from God, a lost church from God, a church that's gone away from God, got away from the principles of God's Bible, will do things that sometimes that you wouldn't expect to find in a church of the living God. They'll get their money by bunco games, playing lottery, gambling, anything that they can do. They'll teach anything, let anything get by. Pat man on the back who's big payers in the church and so forth like that to let them get by with it. That's right. Put deacons on the board, been married four or five times just in order to get by with it to make ends meet. There's only one in you've got to meet. That's your obligation to God. Stand and tell the truth. Lost. Lost man is in a bewildered state. He's a madman. The guy has understanding how to go and what to do. God in God has always sent a guide to his people. God has never failed. He sends a guide. But you've got to accept that guy. You've got to believe it. You've got to go the way he said. If you get into a wilderness and your guide says we go this way and yet you think you go that way, you're going to come up lost. Now when you, God sends us a guide to guide us, we've got to follow that guy. No matter what we think, what looks reasonable, and what looks ridiculous, we're not subjects to divide that. The God is the only one. God in the Old Testament sent prophets. They were guides because the word of the Lord came to the prophet. They were guides. They instructed the people as we had last night of Isaiah uh, and uh, Uzziah. They was instructed and they instructed the people and guided them. And now God has always sent His guides. He's always never been without a guide. All through the ages, God's always had somebody that represented Him on this earth. In all ages. Now sometimes they get off the guy, off the beam, as we call it. When Jesus is here on earth, don't you remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, You blind guides? Blind guides, blind the spiritual things. See? Now they were supposed to be guides. Guides to the people. Guiding the people to salvation. But Jesus said, you're blind. And he said, let them alone. For if the blind lead the blind, won't they both fall in the ditch? 
blind guides. Oh, how the world has been contaminated with that. Blind guiding. He doesn't want you to rely on your own understanding. God does not want you to rely on your understanding or your thoughts or any man-made thoughts. God sends a guide and God wants you to remember that that's His appointed guide. And we must remember Him. Here it says, Jesus said, I will not leave you, but I'll pray the Father and He'll send you another comforter. And this comforter, when He was to come, was to guide us to all truth. Amen. Amen. And the Word of God is the truth. Amen. And the Word is Christ. Amen. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Then, if we follow the real true God, the Holy Spirit, He was to tell us what He had seen, what He had heard. And He was to show us things that is to come. Amen. There you are. He is going to show you things to come. And when the churches today reject that, how can we ever expect to go to heaven? When the Holy Spirit was sent to us for a guide, we'll take some cardinal, some bishop, some general overseer, or somebody like that to guide us. When the Holy Spirit was given to us to guide us. And the Holy Spirit always speaks of the Word. I've got many things to tell you. You cannot understand it now. But when He comes, He'll guide you to it. That's the reason the coming of the seal. At the finishing of the seventh seal, the mystery of God should be finished. To know who God is. What He is. How He lives. His nature, His being, you're supposed to be all the way up here by that time. Bring us into the full statue of sons and daughters of God. A church that's washed in the blood of Christ. That's bought without money. It's paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, here we are. A guide. And He is God's provided guide. Now, we're going through a wilderness. And we're on a road somewhere. And we can't get along without this guide. And dare anybody to try to substitute any other guy. If you do, he'll take you off the line. This guy knows the way. He knows every inch of the way. He knows every thought that's in your heart. He knows everybody's here. He knows who you are and what you've done and all about you. He's God's God. The Holy Spirit. And will reveal things to you. And will tell things that He's heard. Can repeat your words right back and say what you said. Amen. Tell you what you've been, what you've got, where you're going. A guide. The correct guide. And He will guide you to all truth and His Word is the truth. Now the Holy Spirit will never make say amen to some kind of a man-made creed. It will only punctuate the Word of God with amen. Because it's so. The Holy Spirit will not lead you any other way. Now the strange thing is that we all, all of our great denominations and things, we claim each one led by the Holy Spirit, and there's as much difference as there is day and night in all of us. But when Paul, that little Pharisee that received the Holy Spirit, when Ananias baptized him, and he went into Arabia and studied for three years, come back and never consulted the church about anything for 14 years. And when he come and met uh, Peter, the head of the church at Jerusalem, they were eye to eye in doctrine. Wow! The same Holy Spirit. Where Peter baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Paul did the same. Without anybody saying. Where Peter taught the baptism of the Holy Ghost and sanctification and so forth, Paul did the same thing without consulting the church because it was the same God. And how can we be today when people deny these truths? 
When Peter taught what he did about the way the church was to be put in order, Paul had the same doctrine. Because he had the same guy. The guy isn't going to take one over this way, one over that way, and send one east and the other west. He's going to keep you together. And if we'll just let the Holy Ghost keep us together, we'll be one. If, if we just don't let the devil pull you off on the wrong road, we'll be one heart, one mind, one accord by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, the guide of God that will guide us to all truth. Right. But you've got to follow your guide. Yes, sir. Look at Nicodemus. He needed a guide, yet he was a smart man. He was a teacher, about 80 years old. He was of the Pharisees, or uh, the Sanhedrin courts, the council, ministerial association. He was one of their greatest men. A teacher in Israel, a master at it. Think, a master teacher. Yes, he knows the laws. But when it comes to being born again, he needed a guide. He was hungering for it. He knew there had to be something different. His expression to Christ that night proved it. It proved also the, the feeling of the rest of them. But none of them had the very, the very uh, audacity that he had. <laughs> there was none of them that could come up there and do what he did. You know, people condemned Nicodemus for coming by night. He got there. He arrived. I know some people won't even start. They are night. <laughs> but he got there. And he needed a guide. And he said, Master, we, from the St. Adrian Court, we know that your teacher come from God. Why did he know it? He was a vindicator. See, he wanted to know what this new birth meant. And he went to the right one because God had vindicated that this was his guide. Amen. Jesus, look what he said. Master, we know that the other teacher comes from God because no man can do the things that you do lest God be with him. Amen. It was a vindication there that there was a living God inside of him. Amen. What he testified. Not me that doeth the worst. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. Verily I say to you the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. That doeth the Son likewise. Right. The Father worketh and I worketh the other two. In other words, God showed him what to do. And he went and just acted it out. Right. He didn't do anything until God told him to do it. Amen. 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 That's the real frank facts of it. Amen. If we just move and wait till the Spirit moved us to do it. That's it. And then be so completely lost in Christ that he don't have to shove you around like he does me. But the first little nod of his head, you're ready. And nothing's going to stop you. Because you know that it's the will of God. He needed a guide. He was a vindicated guide. He could be led by this guy because he knew this guide was inspired of God. He knew that the traditions that he had served, maybe it was the Pharisees, Sadducees, and whatever more, he had served those creeds all along and seen nothing happen. But here comes a man on the scene saying that he is a promised Messiah of the Bible. Then he turns around and does the very works of God. Jesus said, if I don't do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if you can't believe me, be the very works that I do. For they testify of me. Then no one in Nicodemus could say, Master, we know your teacher come from God. For no man can do the things that you do without God being with him. See, he needed a guide. Though he was a master of the thing. He was a master of his church. He had dignity. And he had, he had prominent places. And he was a great man. No doubt respect from all the people in the country. But when it comes to being born again, he needed a guide. Amen. So do we. Amen. We needed a guide. Cornelius. He was a great man. An honorable man. He built churches. He respected the Jews because he knew that their religion was right. And he paid alms. And he prayed every day. But when the Holy Ghost comes, something had been added to the church. He needed a guide. God sent him the Holy Ghost. He sent him the person of Peter. For while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on him. God used the guide to Peter. 
He used it because he guided Cornelius to the right way. And while he was yet speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on them Gentiles. Then he said, Can a man forbid water that these should not be baptized? See, still the guide speaking. Right, right, not Peter, because that's a bunch of Jew, or Gentiles. Unclean, dirty to him. And he didn't even want to go. But the guide said, I'm sending you. <laughs> you do things that you don't think you would do. When the guide gets completely controlled. When you let him guide you. Oh, how wonderful it is to be led by the Holy Spirit. He is the God. All right. He spoke to Peter and told him what he must do. Then when they all received the Holy Ghost, he said, we can't forbid water, seeing these as received the Holy Ghost like we did at the beginning. And they baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, who led him to do that? The guide that was in him. Didn't Jesus tell him, take no thought what you're going to say? Because it's not you that's speaking. Amen. It's the Father that dwelleth in you. Amen. He doeth the speaking. Amen. Amen. The beauty coming down from Jerusalem. And our, God had a guide in the world at that time, the Holy Ghost. And He had a man down there that was filled with this guide. <laughs> he wasn't even a preacher. He was kind of a deacon like and he was down there healing the sick and casting out devils and causing a big stir. Amen. Great Amen. joy was in the city. Amen. He had hundreds of people gathered around him. And the guide said, It's far enough. Let's go back this way. Amen. He didn't dispute with his guide. <laughs> don't never dispute your guide's word. Follow him. Right. If you don't, you come up lost. That's right. And remember, when you leave him, you're on your own. That's right. So we want to keep close to the guide. So on the road. He said, leave this bunch down, Philip, and go out into the desert where there isn't anybody. But I'm sending you out there and there'll be somebody <laughs> when I get you out there. Here come a lonesome eunuch. He's a great man to the queen down in Ethiopia. So he was coming down right reading the book of Isaiah. And the guide said, go near the chariot. And he said, does thou understand what you read? He said, how can I understand when there's no man to guide me? Oh, my. Lord. But Philip had the guide. Amen. Amen. And he started from the same scripture and preached to him Christ. God. Not telling him some creed. He told him about the God. Christ. And he baptized him out there in some water. Sure it was. Oh, how I liked that. When Israel left Egypt for the promised land in Exodus 13, 21, God knew that they had never traveled that way before. It was only 40 miles. But yet, they needed something to go with them. They'd lose their way. So God sent them a guide. Exodus 13, 21, something like this. I send my angel before you, the pillar of fire. To keep you in the way. To guide them to this promised land. And the children of Israel followed that guide. Amen. The pillar of fire. Right. Night, cloud, the day. When it stopped, they stopped. Right. When it journeyed, they journeyed. Right. And when he got them close to the land and it wasn't fit to go over, he led them back into the wilderness again. Right. He wouldn't go with them. That's what is the church today. No doubt, but what... The long suffering of God today, like it was in the days of Noah, the church had done been gone if it's just corrected and set in order. But He has to lead us around and around and around. Little of Israel know when they were shouting on seeing the dead soldiers of Egypt, the drowned horses, Pharaoh's chariots turned upside down. They got the victory. Moses in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit. Miriam dancing in the Spirit. And the daughters of Israel running up and down the bank, shouting and dancing. They were only a few days from milk and honey. <laughs> Little they know it was 40 years away because they began to grumble against God and the guide. <laughs> and we find ourselves the same way. I go to Shreveport after here. And the Holy Ghost fell Thanksgiving Day 50 years ago. And, and that, Louisiana, on Thanksgiving Day. How the church has fell since that time. Do you realize that the Roman Catholic Church 
at its beginning was a Pentecostal church. That's the truth. That's right. It was a Pentecostal church. But the starchy dignitaries begin to get in and change the, the scriptures of God to their traditions. Add to it dogmas and so forth. They look what they got now. Not a speck of scripture in any of it. They substituted something for something else. A piece of bread for the Holy Ghost. They substituted sprinkling for immersing. They substituted Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for the Lord Jesus Christ. They substituted all these great articles of God that was laid down to us and they're far, far away. Way away from the scriptural doctrine. And Pentecost fell in Louisiana 50 years ago. And if it stands another 200 years, it'll be farther away than a Catholic church is. If it keeps falling the way it has these past 50 years. Because they're just adding to it all the time. Constantly. The old-fashioned preachers is gone. The street meetings, you never hear of one. All the thing we got is a bunch of Hollywood added to it. Bobbed haired women wearing shorts, painted up, and everything else calling themselves Christians. Amen. Some little Ricky with a guitar running up and down the place, and woman with a dress on so tight like a like a skin wiener with a, the skin on the outside almost shaking around up on the platform, running up and down the platform dancing with ear bobs hanging down and one of these here new lady of the land haircuts. Then call itself Christianity. What we need is an old fashioned God said scalding religion that will scald that word in this out of the church. We need to come back to the Holy Ghost and fire. Back to the thing that burns out the throne. Where's the old fashioned preaching back? Make heaven high and hell hot. Gun barrel straight. That's right. We need that kind of preaching. But you do it today, your congregation will vote you out. Sometimes good preachers are led astray by their congregation. That's right. That's the reason I have no denomination. I have one headquarters that's from heaven. Wherever he stands out, I go. Whatever he says, I say. We don't own no denomination. This church ever talked about denomination? You lost your pastor right then. I wouldn't hang around in not one five minutes. Every church that ever not denominated went to the seed and tell me one that didn't and tell me one ever rose again. The Holy Spirit is sent to lead the church, not some yeah. group of man. Amen. The Holy Spirit is all wisdom. Amen. Man gets starchy, indifferent. That's true. God told them and He'd send them a guide. He'd lead them the way. Lord. And as long as they followed that pillar of fire, it was all right. Amen. He led them up to the promised land gate. And then that's as far as he is to go. And Joshua, that great warrior. Remember the day that he told them, sanctify yourself. The third day God's going to open up Jordan down here and we're going across. Watch what he said. I like this in the scripture. He said, Stay close behind the ark, for you've not passed this way before. Mm. What was the ark? The word. Don't travel your denominational routes now. Stay right behind the word, because you haven't passed this way before. Brother, there was a time that the Christian church ought to examine itself is right now. We're right now worthy of great. Uh, meeting is going on in Rome right now. Differences are being made. The confederation of churches, when all these denominations are confederated together to form the image of the beast, just exactly what the Bible says, and you know what we said this morning in the messages. And here we are, right, everything right at the door, and people still falling after creed. You better stay behind the word. The word will lead you across because the word is Christ, and Christ is the God, and God is the Holy Ghost. Stay behind the word. Oh, yes, sir. Stay with that guy. Stay right behind it. Don't get in front of it. You stay behind it. Let it lead you. Don't you lead it. You let it go. Joshua said, now you've never passed this way before. You know nothing about the road. That's a trouble today. You don't need no guide to guide you down the Broadway. Oh, you know all the alleys and everything else. You know all the way to sin. <laughs> There's no, oh, you've been around a long time. There's no need of somebody trying to tell you about that. You know all the shortcuts. That's right. Ever sin. You know all about it. Nobody has to tell you how to steal. You know that. Nobody has to tell you how to curse. You know that. Nobody has to tell you how to do these evil things because it's posted on every tree everywhere. But remember, you people that's Christians, you've crossed over. 
You're into another land. Thank you, Jesus. You're born again. Amen. You're in the land of heavenly land. Thank you, You're in the promised land. Amen. You can, you know your way around here. Oh my, yes. You know what, uh, what, how to stand on a certain hand of cards. You know what, the dice when it rolls, what it means, and everything like that. But when it comes to know the holiness and righteousness and the power of God and how the Holy Spirit operates and what it does, you better stay right behind the Word, the God. Amen. Amen. You've never passed this way before. Well, you say I was a pretty smart man. I had, I had two degrees in college. You better forget it. Amen. <laughs> Yes, sir. I went to a seminary. You better forget it. Amen. You better stay behind the guy. Right. Let him lead you. He knows the way you don't. Right. You haven't passed this way before. Amen. Well, you say they have. See if they have. Yeah. Jesus said those that pass this way, these signs will follow them. Amen. <laughs> My name is shall cast out devils, Amen. speak with new tongues, or take up serpents, or drink anything. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Most of them refuse it, deny it. Say it's not even inspired. They're not following the guide. They're following a man-made creed. That's right. You better stay right behind the word because you haven't passed this way, you know. But uh, you're born again and you've been born in the holiness. You've not passed this way b- before. You pa- if you pass this way, you have to come through holiness because it's a new land, a new life, a new people. You'll come to church and you hear somebody raise up our glory to God, hallelujah. Well, you'll say, my goodness, they never did that in my church. I'll get up and walk out. <laughs> See, be careful. Stay behind the Word now. Amen. Let the guide lead you. He will guide you into all truth and reveal these things that I've talked to you about. He'll show you that. He'll tell you things that is to come. The true God. Don't go to the bishop. Go to the guide. Amen. <laughs> Don't go to anyone but the guy. Amen. He's the one that was sent to guide you. Right. He's the one that will do it. God has provided you a guide. That's right. Take God's provided way. Yes. The trouble of it is today that uh, uh, people come to the church and sit a few minutes. Something goes on that they're not used to. I admired a little woman from a cold formal church. Just had prayer for her. God's going to heal the little woman. She didn't understand this. She knows nothing about it. She come in she said... She didn't know, but I told her, come on and see me. She was kind of timid and backward, but the guy kept telling her, move on. <laughs> she got it. That's it. See, it's because of the Holy Spirit that guides us to these things. See, God has a provided way. Did you ever, have you been noticing the wild geese going over? Yeah. The ducks going south? When I remember, that little old duck was born up down on a pond somewhere. He don't know east, north, west, and south. He knows nothing but that pond sitting up there in the mountains in Canada. He never was off that pond. But he was born a leader. That little Drake was born to be a leader. And the first thing one night there's a big snow comes across the top of the mountains. What happens? That cold breeze comes down across the earth. I can imagine him shivering saying, Manny, what does this mean? <laughs> he never felt that cold weather before. He begins to notice around. He begins to notice. Around the edge of the pond, it begins to freeze. <laughs> Ice coming on the pond. He doesn't know, but all of a sudden, he was born to be a guide to that herd of ducks. He'll jump right out in the middle of that pond when it strikes him. You can call it what I want to. We call it inspiration. You can call it, uh, oh, just instinct. Whatever it is, he'll drive right out in the middle of that pond, stick that little honker up in the air, and go honk, honk. Honk, honk. And every duck on the pond will come right to him. Wow! They know their leader. Just the way he honks. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who can prepare himself for battle? Right. Who can prepare himself for battle if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound? Well, if that little duck gives an uncertain home, who's going to prepare himself for flight? That little old duck will stick up his little bill out there and honk, 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 and every little duck will come to you. Honk, 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 honk. Here they are. Such a jubilee they'll have right there in the middle of that pond. Just turning over and over and over. After a while, he feels it moving on. He's got to leave. <laughs> He'll set his little wings down and fly off that pond. 
Get up in the air and turn around four or five times and go just as straight to Louisiana as he can go. <laughs> Every duck right behind him. Honk, 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 honk. Here he comes. Why? Wow. He's a guy. Amen. 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 No, they're a guy. The church does it. <laughs> he knows what to do. Look at them old geese from Plum from Alaska. Now, there's an old gander always leads them. And them geese has to look that gander over real good. They have to know what that gander's talking about. Did you read that look magazine here about four years ago? Where an old gander one time didn't know what he was doing, and he led a bunch of geese all the way over to England. <laughs> right. They never was known to be in England before. Why? They never noticed their, their leader. That old gander didn't know where he was going. And now they're over there and can't get back. That's what's the matter with a whole lot of these geese today. They still swarm. They say, the look, magazine said these geese swarm and fly all around over England, but they don't know how to get back. That's the way it is with some of the geese that I know of. You have a swarm in a big protracted meeting and have some revivalists to come along and preach a while, but you don't know where you're going. That's Swarming right. around and around. That's right. Because you've got some gander to lead you off on a denomination right. spree and not back to the Word of God. Back to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then we wonder why we ain't got revival in our days. <laughs> See? you got to get that certain sound. <laughs> that sound is a gospel trumpet breathing out the gospel. Amen. Every word of God. Not creed, not denomination, but the Bible. Amen. The Holy Spirit. These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. See? There they go down the road. One old gander one time, he said, got a bunch killed. Trying to fly them through the darkness, didn't know where he's going himself. And they all hit against the mountains out there and some of them disintegrated. <laughs> Burst it up. Sure, they've got to know their certain sound. That little old duck, if he's got the certain sound and everybody knows it, they have a little swarming jubilee and away they go to the south. Well, they go down there for a word ain't cold. That's right. Now, if God give a duck enough sense to know how to dodge the cold, how hard do you give the church? Amen. If a duck can do that by instinct, what about the Holy Amen. Ghost in the church? Amen. Lord, to lead us from old formalities and creeds and names into a glorious, wonderful baptism of the Holy Ghost and Amen. virtue, knowledge, patience, godliness, Amen. and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what the real God will lead because He'll breathe out nothing but the gospel, just the Word of God. Sure. You need a guide. Amen. When the wise man... They didn't know nothing about God. They were, they were magic workers, magicians. That's right. They were over in the Orients. You know, the Bible said, we have seen His star in the east come to worship Him. They were from the west. They looked east and saw His star. Right. Or looked west. They were in the east. We were in the east and saw His star in the west. Right. See? We have seen His star in the east and see, they were in the east. When we were in the east, we saw the star, and we've come to worship him. I can imagine seeing those fellows getting ready to go. I can imagine one of their wives said to him, said, Say, you got everything all packed up, but where's your compass? He said, I, I ain't going to use the compass this time. <laughs> How are you going to get across the mountains? Remember, they had to cross the Tigris River and come down through the plains. and the, Well, they had two years' trip on camels. How are they going to do it? Said, we well, ain't me taking the compass. Said, no, how you going? I'm going God's provided way. That star yonder is going to lead me to that king. That's it. We have seen his star in the east and followed it all the way here in the west to worship him. Where is he? They followed God's provided way. They got tied up with a bunch of creeds down there for a little while. They come into Jerusalem. And begin to go up and down the street. These famous dressed people saying, Where is he? Where is he? Born king of the Jews. Well, that was the head. That's Jerusalem. Surely the big church ought to know something about it. Where is he? Where is he? Born king of the Jews. We've seen his star in the east. We come to worship him. Where is he? Well, they went over to pastor so-and-so and the high priest so-and-so. None of them know nothing about it. Well, there's one born king of the Jews. Where is he? They didn't know. But there's a bunch of shepherds out there on the hillside just having them a time. Right. Yes, sir. Because they have come God's provided way. Amen. So they stay around there and directly said, I'll tell you what we ought to do. We ought to have a board meeting. 
So they called in the Sanhedrin Council and thought if they heard anything about it. Oh, we didn't know nothing about it. That's the same thing it is today. Yes, they don't know nothing right. about this God, this Holy Ghost that heals, feels, saves, coming again. The God that's told us all these things that happened, here we are right in the midst of them. A discerner of the thoughts of the heart. They know nothing about that. They call it mental telepathy or something. They don't know what to say about it. So you see those wise men, as long remembered, when they entered into Jerusalem, the star disappeared. And as long as you look for creeds and denominations, a man to lead you to God, the help of God will lead you. But when they got sick and tired of it and left them, left the creeds and denominations of those Jews and went out of Jerusalem, then the star appeared again, and they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They saw the guide again. <laughs> Oh, how just get off some old cold farm or church and get back to a good one on fire. Yeah. See the guide leading. Amen. What a difference it is. Amen. Yeah, we have seen his star in the east yes. and have come to worship him. Joshua said to them, Now you follow the ark because you've never been this way before. God won't permit that ark to go anywhere but right. Everyone followed it and went right across Jordan. Same as today by the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. The only thing that we know where it's the Holy Spirit or not, we see the magnificent manifestations of it, the manifestations of vindicating the Word of God. Yes. Now, not long ago, a bunch of brethren had blood and oil. That's all right. They won't do that way. I, that ain't a vindication to me. It's a Scripture Amen. vindication. Amen. As long as it's vindicating what God said. That's all right. They said, this is the reason you got the Holy Ghost. You got oil in your hand. Now, I, I can't go for that. See? I don't believe that oil has anything to do with it. And if that's blood go to heal and salvation, what happened to the blood of Jesus Christ? Right. If that oral heals, what about his stripes? Right. 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 I like for the guide to come. Amen. That brings you to the truth of the Word. Amen. Then you know you're zeroed in and you're ready for the countdown. <laughs> that's right, getting ready to fly away. Yes, sir. Yeah, because why? The guide is the one who makes it real. i got a scripture here. I'm giving these scripture, but I want to read this one. It's uh, uh, 2 Peter, the first chapter, 21st verse. For prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. How did the prophecy come? Not by the will of man, denominational creeds, but by the will of God when holy men were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's always been God's God. Amen. That was the Holy Ghost. That was in that pillar of fire. That was the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Any man knows that was Christ. Amen. Moses forsook Egypt, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than that of Egypt. Christ was the one, well, when he stood out there saying, well, you say you're, well, you're not over 50 years old and say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Amen. I am was the one that met Moses in the Amen. pillar of fire in a burning bush. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. He was God made flesh. Amen. Not a third person, the same person Amen. in a different office. Right. Not three gods, three offices of one God. Amen. Correctly. All right. Now, the Scripture always, when God provides, He provides the best. Yes. When God provided a way to fortify His church, He provided the best. Amen. When He gave Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what He gave them was His Word. That's right. You stay behind this Word and you're safe. But if you get from out of it, the day you eat thereof, that day you die. Right. God has never changed His strategy. And Satan has never changed his. How he got into Adam and Eve, he gets into them today. Right. Why? By trying to reason it out. That's right. Now, it's reasonable that God would not. Oh, God has said, said Satan, but surely the Holy God won't do this. Surely he will, because he said he would. Amen. That's what people say they are now. Wait, you don't believe that if I go to church and I pay my tithes and I do this, other, God's going to cast me down unless a man's born again and not even understand the kingdom. Amen. Amen. No excuses. Well, the poor old man, the poor old woman, there's a good old soul. The only way they can ever see God is be born again. That's all. I don't care how little, how old, how young, what they did, how much you went to church, how many denominations they know, how much creed they can recite. You've got to be born again or not. Amen. The foundation Amen. Amen. It's exactly right. So you see, you need the guide. He will guide you to truth, and truth is the word. 
He will guide you. And it always has been. God don't never have to change nothing because He's infinite and He knows what's best. He's on the presence, on the mission. He's, he's everything. Amen. That's Amen. right. God is. Thank you, Jesus. So He don't have to change. All right. He is a confirmer of the way He's leading. That's right. The Holy Ghost of God is a confirmer of the same word that He's teaching. Now, Luke was led by the guide to say, Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. My name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink Amen. deadly things, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. And the Bible said that they went forth everywhere, led by the guides. Right. Preach the word right. with signs following. What was it? The God vindicating Amen. that was the truth. Amen. That was God's policy. Amen. That's the way it was laid down. That's His program. He can't change from it because He's infinite. Amen. Thank you for the word. Hey, Amen. He can't change from it. He's God. Amen. I can change. I'm a man. You can change. You're a man or woman. But God cannot change. Amen. I'm finite. I can make mistakes and say things wrong. All of us can. But God can. And be right. God. Amen. His first decision is perfect. That's right. The way God acts on the scene, that's the way He's got to act every time. Amen. If He's called on the scene to save a sinner, He saves him on the basis of one thing. The next time a sinner comes, He's got to act the same way or He acted wrong when He acted the first time. That's right. Amen. 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 I love it. I know it's the truth. I'm 53 years old, been preaching the gospel here for 33 and a half years. I've never seen it fail. I've seen it tested seven times around the world in all kinds of religions and everything else before as many as a half a million at one time and never has it failed. I don't speak from some book. I speak from personal experience. I know that God stands behind His Word and honors it. Thank you for the Word. Now, if you have some kind of creed, you better watch that. But the Holy Spirit will back up the Word of God. Amen. And St. John, the first chapter and the first verse, he said, He is the Word. Amen. He is the God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs> My, Peter was led to say on Acts 2.38, how to receive the Holy Ghost. He said, Amen. repent every one of you. Amen. Then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And then the God will take you from there on. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing to do. First, repent of your sins, your unbelief, that you disbelieve these things. Repent and then be baptized. And then the God will take you from there on. See, that's your duty. It's your duty to repent. It's your duty to be baptized. Then it's the guide's duty to take you from there on. Lead you from virtue to knowledge to temperance to patience to godliness and to brotherly love, and the Holy Ghost seals you. Then you're a full statue of God, a real man of God, a real woman of God, anchored away in Christ. I love that. Uh, Anchored away in Christ. (laughs) Yeah, Mark was led by the Holy Ghost to write Mark 16, of course. John was led. When he wrote Revelations, he was led by the guide. He was also led by the guide to say, Whosoever shall take one word out of it or add one word to it, the same will be taking his part out of the book of life. All right, you go to substitute something for the word of God and still say you're led by the Holy Ghost. Don't make sense, does it? That's right. It doesn't. He's been my guide through life. He's guided me into life. He was the one that led me to life. And he is my life. Without him, I have no life. Without Him, I want nothing else. He is all my all in all. In the hours of my trouble, He stands by me. Yesterday, He blessed me. Today, they done the same. What can I expect? The same forever. Praise Him. Yes, sir. He promised it. He'll do it. He is my life. He's my guide. All in all. I've trusted Him. I've had some hard trials. I trust Him wherever I go. I want you to do it. If you go to wash, you women, trust Him. Amen. If you go downtown, trust him. Amen. I got one time where I thought that I was kind of a good woodsman, you know, hunted so much. I thought, I'm just foolproof. Nobody's going to... Hey, you couldn't lose me. My mama's a half Indian and I love that old my. Hey, you can't lose me in the woods. I know where I'm at. And off my honeymoon, I kind of cheated a little bit on the wife. I told her, uh, you know, honey, it'd be a good thing for us to get married on October 23rd. 
course, that's when the Lord told me to do And I thought, now for a little honeymoon, I saved up my money, and I'll take her over by Niagara Falls and go over in the Adirondack and do a little hunting. <laughs> See? So I took her and Billy, it's just a little bitty thing. And so I take her on a honeymoon, I was on a hunting trip too, you know. So, so I thought that'd be a good thing to do. And so I took her up and the, I wrote to Mr. Denton, the ranger, and we was going up on Hurricane Mountain, and I said, Mr. Denton, I'm coming up, I want to hunt some bear with you this fall. And he said, okay, Billy, come on up. So he said, I'll be up there on a certain, certain date. Well, wife and I got there a day early, and Billy, and so the cabin was locked up. There was a little lean to back up on the woods where Brother Fred Stop and I went not long ago, stood there, the Holy Spirit. I seen him standing there, that yellow light moving around in the bush, and Fred standing right there. He said, come aside, I want to speak to you. Morris I said, be careful, they set a trap for you. I said, be alert. Is that right, Brother Fred? I went and told hundreds of people that night over in Vermont. I said, there's a trap set for me. I'm going to see it. I don't know where it's at. And the very next night, there it comes. I said, here's a trap that's set. <laughs> yes, sir. But the Holy Spirit led me on what to do. And oh, my. <laughs> that was just right. Oh, many of you know what it was. I haven't time to tell it. But standing there at that place that time, you just begin to turn cold that day. Mr. Denton was coming up the next day. I said, you know, honey, it'd be nice if I got a, a big buck to take home. I said, we did. I had to save these pennies. and We just got married. And I said, we get a winner's meat if I get a little hunt today. And she said, well, go ahead, Billy. I said, now, you remember, I never was in these woods. She said, she was about 25 miles up in the mountains. You know, and she said, I don't know nothing about this. And she said, uh, so I'm, I said, well, now, you remember, it was two years ago, I killed those three bears. That was right back over the top of the mountain over there. And I said, now, I'll get a big buck and we'll get some bear. And I said, we'll have a winter's meat in. Well, that sounds pretty good, you know. And we picked blackberries and got our coal for that, for that winter. And so then Billy sold them and me and I picked them up the evening after I got off of my patrol. So then I, I said, well, I'm going to pick up a rifle. I'm going down here. I said, there's a lot of deer in here. I'll find one. And I said, you know what? I said, then I'll get him. And I said, well, I'll be back in a while. She said, okay. So when I started off, it's kind of low, and you New Hampshire people up in there in the New England knows what it means when that fog comes down, or anywhere else in the mountains, you don't know where you're at, that's all, in case they see your hand before you. So then um, I started down to a, a little chopping light, come down and went over across the ridge and come up, and I noticed a panther, you'd call it here in this part of the country, we call it in the west, a cougar. They call it up there a mountain lion, it's all the same animal, it's a pluma, really what it is. Same cat, about nine foot long, weigh about 150, 200 pounds. He crossed the road and I slipped the gun real quick, not fast enough to get shot at him. Well, I slipped on up over the hill, chasing this cougar, watching the leaves where he moves, you know. I could hear him, that he had four feet. I know he wasn't a two-footed animal. He was four feet, and I know he wasn't a deer because the deer stomps, and he was real easy to cat, you know, like that. And a bear rolls his feet when he walks. And so I knew it must have been a cougar, and he was behind the log, and I didn't see him until I just got a glimpse at him, he was gone. And I watched where he disturbed the leaves, you know, up over the top of the mountain and down like this, and I wasn't watching that cloud coming all the time, you know, coming down the fog. <clears throat> I sat down, went down through a great valley, and went out into the giants, following this cougar. I thought, I'll catch him after a while. And I'd see a place, and I'd run up on a high place and look all around like that and peep around, see if I could see him, listen real close, and get out, slip down again. You hear the brush go crashing. Way ahead of him. That's going out. See, he's hit the trees then, so I couldn't trail him. See, he got smart. Got up in the trees and jumped from tree to tree. Then, he you know, I couldn't trail him there. Oh, I thought, oh, anyhow. And I started back up the canyon, and I whipped the bear, an old male bear. I thought, I'll get him now. Boy, that's good. I whipped again. I went a little farther and watched for all kinds of signs and everything. I couldn't see a thing. Turned back down and went back down the other side of the mountain. And then I began to notice getting a little foggy. Now I go whiff again. He's in the air somewhere. I said, no. And what happened? The wind was coming this way. And I cut the bear whiff come from this down that way. And I've crossed around now. And the wind's coming from this other direction. So I have to go back to where I smelt the bear the first time. And take it from there. And on my road back, I looked across the canyon. And I seen the bushes move. And when I did, something black moved. I thought, there he is. I threw a shell up in my gun real quick and stood still. And what it did is a great big buck, great big one. I thought, that's just what I was wanting anyhow. Shot the buck. I thought, well, I never noticed. It's kind of time I got him fixed up. Look, I cleaned off my hands and fixed my knife, put it back. I thought, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You give me my winner's meat. Praise be to God. And I got my gun. I thought, I'll go right back up the canyon here now. And I said, look here, boy, storm's coming. I better get out of here and get back over to meeting them. I said, I have to hurry. Up the canyon I went, unbuttoned my big red coat, and I was running up the canyon like this around. The first thing you know, I thought, my, where did I turn off at? 
Wind is already down, the trees lapping together. I thought, where did I turn off at? I went around, I, I thought I was going right straight to Hurricane Mountain, but I happened to stop, I was sweating, I thought, what's the matter here? I've been gone a half hour, three quarters. I can't find that place I turned off. I looked up and there hung my deer. It was right the same place. I thought, well, what did I do? Well, I took off again. I thought, I'll make it this time. I just wasn't noticing. I watched every little move, everywhere. Watching, I kept searching, searching, searching. Then clouds coming. I know snowstormers on the road. Fog hanging low. And then I get a notice. I thought, I'll go a little further. Went on, 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 on. I thought, well, this is strange. Looked like I've seen this place before. And I looked and there hung my deer. Oh, my. <laughs> you know what I was on? The Indians call it the death walk. So you're walking in a circle, round and around. Well, I thought I was too good a guide to ever be lost. See? Nothing had to tell me in the woods. I know my way around. See? And I started off again. I said, I can't make this mistake, and I'll come back again. I moved up the canyon a little piece. Then it done start blowing all my snow everywhere, almost towards dark. And I knew that Meaty would die that night in the wilderness. She didn't know how to take care of herself, and Billy just about four years old, three years old. Just a little bitty thing. I thought, what will they do? Well, I got up as far and I hit some moss bed. I thought, I'm in a flat somewhere and I can't see not nothing. It's all foggy. And I was going around. Now, ordinarily, I'd have found me a place and hold up. If I had somebody with me, I'd hold up and wait till the storm was over a day or two to come on out, cut my piece of deer over my back and went in and eat and forgot about it. But you can't do that in your wife and baby laying up there in the woods perishing. See? So I began to think, what can I do? So I went a little farther and I thought, now wait, when I crossed over that first valley, the wind was in my face. So I must have come this way. I've got to come this way. I've wandered way down in the giants, but I didn't know where it was at. I said, oh, I began to get nervous. I thought, wait a minute, Bill, you're not lost. Try to bluff myself. You can't bluff it. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> that inner conscience tells you you're wrong. Or you, you try to say, oh, I'm saved. I go to church. Don't you worry. You wait till that deathbed comes. You know it's different. Your conscience tells you. Something inside of you tells you you're wrong. See? You know if you die, you couldn't meet a holy God. As we seen Him last night, even the holy angels have to veil their face to stand before Him. How are you going to stand outside the blood of Jesus Christ to veil you? I thought, well, I'll make it. I started on, and I found out. I kept hearing something. Then I got nervous. I thought, now if I do that, I'm going to go to pieces. That's usually what a lost man does. He goes to pieces in the woods. Then he'll take his gun and shoot himself or fall over a ditch and break his leg and there he lays. He'll die there. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I started walking on. And I kept hearing something saying, I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. I just kept walking on. I thought, now I know I'm getting sizzles off. Now I'm hearing a voice talk to me. I kept going on. I was whistling. You know, I thought, well, I'm not lost. You know where you're at, boy. What's the matter with you? You can't get lost. You're, you're too good a hunter. You can't get lost. Self-bragging. So making myself bluff myself through. You can't bluff it. Way down here is a little wheel turning and saying, Boy, you're lost. And you know you are. Right. You're lost. That's right. I kept moving on. Oh, I'm not lost. I'll be all right. I'll find my way out. Things begin to look funny. Wind's close. Snow begin to fly. And a little hominy snow. We call it spitting down. And I thought a wife and baby. I'm not... I thought, oh my. Directly I heard that again and said, I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. I was a minister of the gospel and preaching right here at the tabernacle. So, I thought, well, what can I do? I stopped. Looked every word. It's fog already down now. I, that was it. <laughs> Nothing could be done then. I thought, oh, what can I do? I thought, sir, I'm not fit to live. I've had too much self-confidence. I thought it was a hunter, but I'm not. Brother, I've always trusted him. Shooting. I've got records up there. And a fisherman, I'm a poor one, but I've always trusted him. Shots, I'm a poor shot, but he's let me make world records on it. Shoot deer seven, eight hundred yards. Got a gun up there, killed 35 head a game without missing a shot with it. <laughs> Just read that anywhere if you can, see. Not me, it's him, I've trusted him. There I was. I thought, what can I do? What can I do? And I kept getting closer and closer. I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. A very present help. I thought, is that God talking to me? I took off my hat. I had my patrol hat. Red handkerchief wrapped around it. I laid it down. 
took off my coat as moisture. I laid my coat down, set my gun up against the side of a tree. I said, Heavenly Father, now I'm getting beyond myself. I'm hearing a voice speaking to me. Is that you? I said, Lord, I'm going to admit to you that I ain't no hunter. I, I, I can't find my way around. You have to help me. I'm not fit to live and doing the things that I've done. Coming in here and thinking I know too much about to ever get lost. I need you, Lord. My wife is a good woman. My baby, my little boy, his mother's gone on. And she's trying to be mother to him. And I just married her. Here she is, a kid down in the woods. They'll both die tonight. That wind will turn down about ten below zero. And they won't know how to live. They'll die tonight. Don't let them guy God. Take me to them so that I can see that they don't die. I'm lost. I'm lost, God. I, I can't find my way around. Won't you please help me and forgive me for my own self-centered way. I can't do nothing without you. You're my guide. You help me, Lord. I got up and I said, Amen. Picked up my handkerchief, my coat. Picked it up, put my hat back on. Picked up my gun. I said, Now, I'll fix myself in the very best way that I know how to go. The very best of my understanding. And I'll go straight one way because I'm walking around the circle somewhere. I don't know where. But I'll go the way you tell me, Lord God, my guide. I started walking this way. I said, This is it. I have to make myself believe it. I'm going this way. I'm going straight this way. I'm not going to vary. I'm going this way. I know I'm right. I'm going this way. If I'd have went that way, I'd headed off over in Canada. See? Just then I felt something touch me on the shoulder. A hand. It felt like a man's hand. So quick I turned around to look. There was nobody standing. I thought, what was that? Here's the Bible laying before me. God, my guide and judge is standing here. I just looked up. And right back this way, that fog just cleared back so I could see the tower on top of here came out. Going right straight away from it, the best of my hunting ability, I was going away from it. Get real late in the evening then. I turned real quick, directing myself like this. I took over my hat and raised up my hand. Thank you. I said, guide me over. God, Thank you. you're my guide. Amen. I started. I had to go right straight up bluffs and everything getting there. Later and later, then it got dark. Deers were jumping in front of me and everything. I couldn't think of nothing but keeping myself one way right up this mountain. Now, I know if I could get to the tower, Mr. Denton and I, I helped put the line up that spring. We tacked the telephone wire from the Hurricane Mountain all the way down about three and a half or four miles right down to the camp. And it went right down a little trail, but the snow on there, you couldn't tell the trail. See? And the wind blowing and everything, it dark and blizzard and going, you couldn't tell where you was at. Well, the only thing I knew to do after it got dark, and I didn't know I knew I was going one way and right up the mountain because I was supposed to go up the mountain, and the tower set right at the top of the mountain, now, I had about six miles to get to it. Just think that fog clearing back six miles, just one hole. Now, I could see it. And then I, I packed my rifle. And this hand, holding his hand up, because I tacked the, the wire on the trees like that, going down the telephone wires to the cabin so he could talk to his wife. And then call out from there, from the mountain. And I was going to help him take it down that fog. And I had my hand up like this, saying, Oh, God, let me touch that line. Well, my arm gets so sore, tired, I couldn't hardly hold it. I have to let it down. I change the gun and put it in that step back a couple of steps so I'd be sure not to miss it. And raise my hand up. Start walking. Walking. Getting late. Dark. Wind blowing. Oh, I grab a hold of my limb. I say, that's it. No, that's not it. Oh, it gives, don't let it give an uncertain sound. After a while, when I was just about ready to give up, my hand hit something. Oh my. I'd been found when I was lost. I held to that water. I dropped the rifle right down. Tucked my hand off my head. I stood there. I said, Oh God. What a feeling it is to be found when you're lost. I said, Right down to the end of this wire. I'll never turn it loose. I'll hold on to this wire. It'll guide me right straight to work all on this earth. It's dear to me. It's laying right down there. My wife and baby frantically, not knowing where I am, not knowing how to make a fire, not knowing what to do. And winds are blowing and the limbs are popping and falling off the trees. I was daring to let go of that wire. 
I helped that wire till it guided me right in to where all that was dear on earth was to me. That was a horrible experience and a great experience to find my way out. But that wasn't half of it. One day I was lost in sin. I went church after church trying to find something. I went to the Seventh-day Adventists. They told me, keep the Sabbath. Quit eating meat. I went over to the Baptist church, First Baptist church. He said, just get up and tell them that you believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and I'll baptize you. That's it. It wasn't nothing but one day out in a little coal shed. I held my hands up. I caught a hold of something. Or may I say something got a hold of me. (laughs) It was a lifeline. The guide. And he's led me safe this far. I ain't going to take my hand off that wire. I'm holding my hands to him. Let creeds and denominations do whatever they want to. I'm holding on to the guide. For all there's ever on earth and all that's in heaven ever means precious to me is at the end of this line. He's brought me safely this far. I'll trust him the rest of the way. When He, the Holy Ghost, has come, He will guide you and lead you into all it. Friends, it's brought me where I am today. It's made me what I am. I can gladly introduce it to you. It's the only guide that I know anything about. For you're on earth or up there. He is my guide when I go hunting. He's my guide when I go fishing. He's my guide when I talk to somebody. He's my guide when I preach. He's my guide when I sleep. And when I come to die, He'll be standing at the river. Hallelujah. He'll guide me across the way. I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they'll correct me and guide me across the river. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the guide, the one who leads me. Oh, sometimes, Father, I can't hear him around me. I get scared. I want him close to me because I don't know what time I'm going to run up on the river. I want him to be near me. Don't never leave me, Lord. I can't talk. I can't preach. I can't hunt in the woods. I can't fish on the banks. I can't drive my car. There's nothing I can do without you. You're my guide. How happy I am to say this congregation tonight. How that you have got him in all these things. How that you have brought me. I was thinking the other day, no more than a few years ago, standing out here on the street, and because that my family had done wrong, no one would talk to me. I was lonesome for fellowship. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. I said his dad is a bootlegger. And Lord... So no one would talk to me and I love people. But one day when I caught a hold of that line, now I think, Lord, I have to slip off and get out into the wilderness to get a little rest. What did it? Not personality, not education, I have none. But it was you, Lord. You, Lord. You let me zero the target. You let me catch the big fish because you know I wanted to do it. You give me fathers and mothers. You give me brothers and sisters. You give me my health. You give me a wife. You give me family. You're my guide, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let me hold your hand. Don't never let me turn loose. Lord. If one hand gets weary, I just change hands. Help me, Lord. Now may each one in here take a hold of that same lifeline, Lord. The Holy Spirit, which is our life, life giving resource. And may it guide us all to that happy land on earth where the toils of life is over and our work on earth is done and then there will be no more old age no feeble people no more weary nights no more crying and praying no more altar calls but we'll be young there forever sickness and sorrow will be no more there will be no more sin we'll live in righteousness of God to all ages that is to come to a ceaseless eternity Granted, Father, and now, Father, if there's any in here tonight who's never had a hold of that lifeline, may they find it right now. And may the Holy Spirit, who's guided me, and I can say from my heart with my hand on your word, He's always been right. I'm wrong many times, but He's right. 
Let him stay with me, Lord. Let me stay with him. And may others in here who don't know him tonight, may they take a hold of his unchanging hand that they might be guided down. And someday we're coming out to the river. It's going to be foggy that morning too. The old sea will be roaring. The old Jordan. The breakers are dashing. Death choking the life out of us. <laughs> but God, I won't be scared. I settled it a long time ago. I just want to take off the helmet as a warrior. Turn around and look back down the path to see where that line has guided me to. See all the wilderness I've come to and every briar patch and every pile of stones that I've got bruised on. But holding the wire, as you said, the poet did, some through the waters and some through the floods, yes. some through deep trials, but all through the blood. Yes. And I won't take this, the whole sword here that's protected me along the road and stick it back in the sheath. Scream out, Father, stand across the boat this morning. I'm coming in home. You'll be there, Lord. You promised it. You can't fail. Bless everyone that's here now. And if they don't know how to hold this line and never touch it, may holy hands raise up now, wanting hands, desiring hands, and touch the lifeline that will lead them to their heart's desire, perfect peace and satisfaction, rest in Christ. With our heads bowed, would there be a hands that raise up and say, let me hold my hand. Oh, God bless you. When the ways growing drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, at the river I'll stand. Guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. There'll be another raise up their hand and say, Lord, I want to feel the touch of the lifeline tonight. I want to feel Christ has forgiven me of my sins. And I want to be a new creature from this hour on. God bless you. But to be another, so let me touch you, Lord. Let me lose myself. God bless you, sister. Let me lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. God bless you. God bless you. That's right. Let me lose myself, Lord. Let me forget. God bless you, brother. Let me, God bless you, sister. Let me just lose all my knowledge. God bless you, sister. Don't trust in man-made schemes. Follow the guide. He'll guide you into all truth. Lead me, Lord Jesus. Lead me. God bless you back there. Oh, many hands has been up wanting salvation. Now, while we're you're, the altar here, you can't call the altar because people are sitting all over it. But he's right there. You know good and well when you raise your hand, something happens in your heart. Jesus said, He that heareth my words, and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. You mean it? Then there's a pool here filled up with water. There'll be plenty of time for baptism. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, this little broke up message tonight through a hoarse voice. The Holy Spirit must have went out somewhere. It went where it was purpose. And there's many, Lord, tonight, some 15 or 20 raised up their hands that they need the guide. They realize that they're trying to fool themselves. They're trying to say, I'm all right, but way down deep they know they're not. And they want to feel you, Lord. They want the guide. They want to sign up. You're never overstocked. They want to sign up for this trip. They don't know how to get there. No one knows how to take them there. You're the only one. They're coming for God's provided guide. The Holy Spirit. They've raised up their hands. Oh, Holy Ghost and God, come down upon them. Forgive every sin. Pardon their iniquities. Take them into the body of Christ tonight where they can feel the current of God flowing through that line that will lead them on down to the Jordan and across Jordan to the Promised Land. And they follow straight behind the Word. The Word said, Repent and then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. May they not try it some other way. May they follow right behind the Word. But He's the one that will guide. 
That's the, that's the steps to climb over till we can catch a hold of the guide. Grant it, Lord. May they be yours. They are in your hands now as trophies. No man can pluck them out. I believe that you will take them as saved people. I believe they raised up their hands. They could not have done that in themselves unless something spoke to them. That was you, Holy Spirit and God. They see the hours closing in. Fog is coming over the earth. Great creeds and, and things are uniting together. Churches are confederating, coming together. And oh God, how they're trying to say all that has a peculiarity will have to leave here and go to Alaska. And all these things that they're threatening, it's not new to us. The great guide has showed us that in the path of the Word. We're just passing through that part of it. Father God, He spoke to them tonight, and I give them to you now as trophies of the Word in Jesus' name. Now, laying on the desk here, Father, is handkerchiefs. It's for sick people. Some little baby, maybe. Some mother. Some sister. Some brother. Even little hairpins stuck in them. And now I hold them up close to me. Now, we're taught in the Bible that they took from the body of Paul handkerchiefs and aprons. And sick people were healed. Unclean spirits went out of people. Now, we realize, Lord, that Paul was a man. He was just a man. But it was the anointing of the Holy Ghost that was on him that blessed the handkerchiefs and the faith that the people had that he was your apostle. Now, Paul has been taken from us, but not the guide. He's still here. God, I pray that you'll bless these handkerchiefs. And may the guide lead them to the place that complete surrender. We're told again that when Israel was following their guide, and they come right down to Jordan, right down rather to the Red Sea, and the very line of duty, they were stopped. And the guide led them down there. Why? To show His glory. And when all hopes is gone, then God looked down through that pillar of fire. And even the old Dead Sea got scared and she rolled back. And there was a path made for Israel to walk over to the promised land. Truly, Lord, you're still the same God. These people maybe are Christians. Maybe they're right in the path of duty. But they've been brought into this cornered place where sickness has cornered them. Look down through the blood of Jesus tonight. That devil will get scared. He'll move back. And your children shall pass over to the promise of good health. Granted, Father, I send them from my body to theirs in the name of Jesus Christ. I lift this congregation before you. By faith I take them plumb to the glorious altar of God, yonder in heaven. For every desire of sickness, whatever they have, it's wrong. Whatever is wrong in their lives, anywhere, God cleanse them. Make them yours. Heal them, Father. May the power that raised up Jesus from the grave quicken their mortal bodies and make them new creations in Christ. Give them good health and strength to serve you. Remember me, O Lord. I am your servant. Help me standing in the need of prayer. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and use us and lead us until the day we see Jesus Christ face to face at His glorious coming when we meet Him in the air at the rapture. In the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. I love you. I love you. If you don't love one another who you have seen, how are you going to love him who you haven't seen? Now when we sing, I love him, let's give our neighbor a, a hearty handshake of love. I
just raise your hands to him. song. Would you like to hear one? I understand that we have a, an evangelist song leader here from Indianapolis. I believe the same as Cato Tabernacle. Is that right? All right, sir. That's his place at Cato Tabernacle. I remember remembers E. Howard Cato. Oh, my. God rest his precious soul. The Mockingbird of the Air. A woman that I love to hear sing better than anybody I nearly ever heard sing in my life was Miss Cato saying, Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior as a shield today. Right across the street there one morning in a little old two-room shack, I got up to go to go in and make a fire. The stove wouldn't burn. And I tried to start it. The wind come down, blowed the thing out my face. And it's cold and I was about froze and frost all over the floor. Me barefooted trying to get this little old tin stove started. Little oven pipe on it. And I just needed and I just been married a little bit. And I was trying. The old wood was wet and wouldn't burn. And I sat there, I thought, oh my, I'll try it again. I had to go to work and fan that old stove like that. And I reached over and turned the radio over on. And she began to sing, Here you left your room this morning. Did you think to pray? I just fell down the floor. <laughs> In the name of Christ our Savior as a shield today. Oh, how I love to hear that woman. When I cross over the river sometime, I believe I'll hear Miss Cadle sitting over there. You know, I've always made an appointment on this side of the river, there's an evergreen tree. You know, the tree of life. And over on the other side of the river, there's an angelic choir that sings day and night. Because there's no night, they're singing all day, you see. I was getting me a place to sit back and listen to it. I believe I hear Mrs. Cadle over there singing. God bless our brother. I forgot his name. What is it, brother? Brother Ned Woolman will sing for you now. Brother Woolman, glad to have you here tonight. 